Let's improve our representation by now representing sets as ordered sequences. So as long as the elements can be put in some order where we know which one's less than or greater than the others, then we can build an ordered sequence set where we're still going to use a recursive list to represent the elements. We'll still disallow repeats, but we'll just make sure everything stays sorted. So a set is represented by a recursive list with unique elements ordered from least to greatest. Now why would we change what we already have? The point is to avoid quadratic time or theta n squared operations. So here's how we're going to do set contains now. Now set contains was linear time before. How do we know whether v is in s or not? Well now we'll ask if s is empty or s dot first is greater than v, then we'll return false. Why does that work? Well, if we find any element in s that's greater than v, and we've started at the beginning, and we've been working our way from least to greatest, we know all the other elements in the rest of s are going to be even larger, and therefore they will be greater than v as well, and thus v cannot be in the set. If s dot first is v, we return true, otherwise we recurse. Set change. Now, the only difference here between set contains with an unordered sequence is that we have a different base case, which will trigger more often, so we may not have to search as far in the list. So what's the order of growth of this implementation? Is it constant time? Is it logarithmic time? No, it's still linear time even though, on average, we'll only have to search through half the list instead of the whole list, assuming we have randomly distributed elements and a randomly distributed v that we're looking for. But still we haven't changed the order of growth of this operation. But intersection does change its order of growth. We need an entirely new algorithm in order to do it. So remember intersection before involved filtering one list with the set contains function for the other. Instead, we're now going to assume that both the sets that we're trying to compute the intersection of have the elements in increasing order. That's our representation of sets. Then we can intersect two sets, set one and set two, recursively as follows. If either set one or set two is empty, then the intersection is empty. Otherwise, let's get the first elements E1 and E2 of set 1 and set 2 respectively. If they're the same, then that element must be in the intersection. The way we express that is by saying we'll return a new R list that contains that element and whatever else is in the intersection of the rest of the two sets. Otherwise, if E1 is smaller than E2, what do we know? Well, we know that the element E1 is not anywhere in set 2, because all the elements in set 2 are either E2 or greater, and E1 is less than that. We don't really know anything about E2, it could be in set 1 somewhere. So we return the result of intersecting the rest of set 1 and set 2 thus discarding the element E1, which was the first element of set 1, but keeping around all the elements in set 2, because we're not done processing those yet. Similarly, if we find that E2 is less than E1, we'll return the intersection of set 1 and the rest of set 2. Notice we've covered all the cases here, assuming that the elements are comparable, which they must be in order to have this ordered representation, We've covered the case where the E1 and E2 are equal, one is less than the other, or the other is less than the first. Let's look at a demo of how this actually runs. Okay, so here's our implementation of set contains two and intersect to set two, meaning we're using sets as sorted ordered sequences this time. Now, intersect set two does not call set contains two, it's an entirely self-contained program, which we can trace.
So we have the set S123. And let's also create a set 234. Now remember, for this demonstration to work, it has to be the case that both sets have their elements in sorted order. But then, if we intersect those two sets, S and T, using this new function that we've defined, we get the following trace. And what does this say? Well, it says we start out with 1, 2, 3, and 2, 3, 4. We compare 1 and 2, find that 1 is smaller, so we discard it. Now we have 2, 3, and 2, 3, 4. We notice that 2 and 2 are the same, so we recurse on the rest of both, 3 and 3, 4. We notice that 3 is the same, so now we're recursing on the empty list and our list 4. Interesting. Now one of them is empty, and so we're done. And as we start to return these values, we're going to reconstruct the intersection as we go. So the intersection starts empty, and then we use that as the rest of the list, and we add the element 3 to the front. Because, well in this call we have detected that 3 and 3 are the same. And likewise, in the previous call we had detected that 2 and 2 are the same. So we add 2 to the front of the result here. So each of these return values is the rest of the next return value. So there's 2, 3. And then in this last call, we just return that same return value because we didn't find anything in the intersection. And that gives us our eventual result. Interesting. What's the order of growth of that function? That's a linear time computational process. Why? Well, in each recursive call, we get rid of at least one element, sometimes two, from the collective set of both the lists. So if each set has a length n, then they collectively have 2n, and so we're making at most 2n recursive calls. And that 2, that constant, is disregarded in order of growth notation. 